Okay. All right. So, yep. I, I have seven o'clock, so I'm going to begin. So, okay. Welcome to the Thursday, April 2nd, 2020 uh, meeting of the planning board. Um, as you can see, we have uh, quite a different uh, approach this evening. So I have a bit of a script to read. So if you could please bear with me, this could take a couple of minutes. Uh, first is a preliminary matter. This is Steve Boulay, chair of the planning board. Um, please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear from me. I'm, I'm going to just do the boarding, uh, planning board members first uh, only, and then I'll ask when we open up the individual hearings for the individuals to um, present themselves as they do during the normal course of business. So, uh, Mr. Rodalakis. Yes, uh, I have no uh, comments this month, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm not doing a comment, I'm just asking you to voice that you're here. Oh, I am here, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Yes, sir, I am here. Mr. Jerry. Yes, I am here. And um, unfortunately, we have one of our members is not feeling well this evening, so he is not going to be present. So Mr. Gordon will not be present today. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, Mr. Bernie Cahill. Bernie, you want to unmute? Unmute. I'm here. Okay, thank you. Um, so good evening. Uh, this opening meeting of the planning board is conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to, and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable. Public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This, this meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the planning board is convening by telephone, the board members by video, and, it, and will be posted on the town's website identifying how many, how the public may join. Uh, we are using Google Hangouts meeting. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that take care not to screen share your computer unless asked by the chairperson or the staff person. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. The meeting business ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each board member or staff member who has the lead role for this particular item and or guest speaker associated with this item on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members first and then to staff members, inviting each by name to provide any comment or questions. I will then call upon the members to offer a motion and then for a second, please hold on until your name is called Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Remember that unless a document is being shared, your camera feed is triggered by your speaking or background noise. Please remember to sp speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For others in attendance that are expected be to present, please hold until your name is called to present. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Remember that unless a document is being shared, your camera feed is triggered by your speaking or background noise. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. After your presentation, members of the board committee will be given the opportunity to ask questions. After the members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call each by name and afford up to three minutes for any comments. 
for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a calligraphy, excuse me, calligraphy with other members, please do, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Roll call, roll call vote, excuse me. That being said, I'd like to bring up the first um, item on the agenda, which is approve and, uh, review and approve minutes. Uh, there are no minutes uh, presented for this month's meeting. Uh, we also, the next item, review and sign bills. There are no bills to be reviewed this meeting. At this time, I will go around the board for board member comments. First person to be called upon, Mr. Rodalakis. Uh, again, I have no comments this month, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Mr. Thomas. None this month, sir. Mr. Jerry. No comments. There you and, <laughs> and Mike, and I guess, so um, I would like to say a couple of comments before we begin. So this is this is quite um, a new experience for all of us, um, and I hope that everything goes as well as we, I anticipate that it will. Um, this is not the first meeting of this type to be handled this way, and I, I was able to witness one of them that went fairly well. So I'm encouraged that we can do this well, provided that everybody does what we're expecting is at least mute your phone, remember to wait to have your name called, run all questions through me, and then we'll avoid any um, talking over of one another. The other thing I would like to uh, mention to the uh, public audience is if you're watching this on television and you're listening to it on the phone, there is a delay from the FCC on the video feed. So I would recommend that you stay on the phone, you can keep it on speakerphone, and just mute your television, and therefore you won't get caught up in the delayed um, voice that comes back and forth over the television. Okay, with that being said, we have our first hearing. It's a new public meeting for a new retail and office building request for a de minimis change for location 274 Walnut Street. As are the uh, applicants present? Uh, yes, I am present. Could you please introduce yourself for the record? Uh, my name is Brandon Barry. I'm here with Bowler Engineering on behalf of the applicant. Okay. Is there anyone else with you to present this evening? There is not, no. Okay. Please uh, go forward and, and present your materials. Um, utilizing Mr. Cahill, I, I, I'm not sure if you're going to be doing the screen driving or if Mr. Cahill will drive any documents that you're looking to put up for the public to see. Um, Bernie, I would defer to you there. Do you want to drive the screen or would you like me to, to do that? I'm happy to put it up right now. Okay. Is it up? Can everyone see it? It's loading for me. Yep, there it is. <clears throat> and we can, yeah, we yeah. can just focus in on that that left side of the plan, Bernie, where the two affected areas are. Um, so first, I just wanted to, to start by saying that, that we really appreciate uh, the town taking the steps necessary to keep the public hearings moving and allows our clients to keep their developments going and, and that keeps our employees hard at work, which is, is extremely important to us right now. Uh, as was mentioned, this is a project at 274 Walnut Street it involves the construction of a one story veterinary building and a two story medical uh, building uh, or office uh, that's to be built on spec. Uh, we were before the board in September of 2019, where the plan was approved in its current state. Uh, and as our client is getting ready uh, to move to construction, hopefully this spring, uh, they were just doing some modifications and refinement of their plan. The big thing that they had noticed is in the previous, the approved location of the trash enclosure was going to be the first thing that the customers would see as they entered the site and turned towards the veterinary use. And they, and they were just hoping to move that to a less prominent location. Uh, so the first area uh, modified there the red lines you're seeing on the screen are the approved curb lines, um, and then the black lines are, are what is what's being proposed. Um, so the trash enclosure was located um, just south of the transformer, which is seen with the three circles for the bollards. So we had a trash enclosure there. Um, we're moving that out of that location and proposing one additional parking space there. So that's where you can see the pavement being expanded a little outside that red line, but we are adding back some green space. Moving to the south of the site, we're pushing the trash enclosure to the end of that parking aisle, so it's it's the last thing that customers see. It's also closer to that rear employee door, so it'll be easier for employees to access when they take the trash out at night. Um, we have, you can see, we're pulling the curb line in there. We've removed the two last spaces in the row to get the trash enclosure out of the steep slope that runs along the frontage of our site along Route 9. Um, so we're proposing a trash enclosure. You can see it kind of mirrors the opposite side of the site now. 
Um, we've removed those two spaces, proposed a new one in that north section. So we have a net reduction in one space. We had 74 spaces on the approved plan. This space, this plan proposes 73 spaces uh, and 52 spaces are required by zoning. So we are still compliant. Um, the access to the site, the building locations, site circulation, utility connections, and stormwater management system are unchanged. Um, really the, the just relocating that trash enclosure to a less prominent area was the intent, um, what we've accomplished. So pretty minor change that we think is an improvement to the site. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll toss myself back on mute and, and see if the board has any questions or comments that I'd be willing to answer. Thank you very much. Um, I will ask for questions from the board first. Uh, Mr. Rodelakis. I'm all set with this. This seems de minimis. Okay. Mr. Thomas. Uh, I have no questions. It is de minimis. Okay. Mr. Jerry. Nope. Sorry, Are you there? Uh, I have no comments. I agree with uh, both Mr. Thomas and Mr. Rodelakis. Okay, I also agree with everyone that this appears to be a de minimis change. Um, can I have a motion? I would uh, move that uh, the board make an actual finding that uh, the relocation of the dumpster and the loss of one parking space constitutes a de minimis change. Do I have a second? Second. I'm going to go roll, roll call for a vote. Uh, Mr. Rodelakis. In, f in favor. Mr. Thomas. In favor. Mr. Jerry. In favor. Mr. Boulay is in favor as well. Thank you, and that takes care of that meeting. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, as well. For any uh, persons, oh, I should have asked for anybody in the audience, so I missed that one. I didn't expect there was going to be a, a question from the audience. Well, I apologize. If there is anyone in the audience that did want to be here, heard on that, I apologize for that. The meeting is closed, and unfortunately, we can't take any questions at this time. I will try not to make that mistake again. Our next meeting, uh, uh, continued public hearing, is for a common driveway and multifamily development site plan approval and special permit for Whitney Street Home Builders, LLC location 257 Main Street. Are the applicants present? No. The applicant for 257 Main Street, Mr. Grenier, are you on the line? Bernie, do you, can you tell if uh, Mr. Grenier uh, is online? I can see that Mr. Venenkas is on the line. I do not see Mr. Grenier yet. Uh, we could take it out of order if you want, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. but let's do that. I, I, well, again, to the to the public, I just want to uh, express some apologies. We're likely to have run into a couple of <laughs> instances. So let's take this one out of order for now. We'll move on to our next public hearing, which is the Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond site plan modification. Uh, Route 20 nominee trust in Demula Super Supermarket Incorporated. It's a new public hearing, location 180, 200, 228 Hartford Turnpike. This is decision deadline 90 days from close of hearing. Mr. Thomas, do you have a, a I'm notice to recuse myself? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Borolakis will be recusing. I do have a legal notice. Please bear with me while I read it from my phone. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. The Shrewsbury Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday evening, April 2nd, 2020 at 7 p.m. in the in the Selectman's meeting room at the Richard D. Carney Municipal Building, 100 Maple Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass., to hear the application of Kelly Riejo, trustee, Route 20 nominee, Trust care of Boston Concessions Group, 55 Cambridge Parkway, Suite 200, Cambridge, Mass, 02142, and Demoulis Supermarkets, Incorporated, care of BSM Realty, Incorporated, 881 East Tewksbury, Mass, 01867, for site plan modification by the Planning Board as required by the Town of Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaw, Section 7, Subsection F3, to allow for the partial modification to the location of proposed residential in amenity buildings, the elimination of a garage and associated modification, degrading and infrastructure as shown on plans entitled 
site plan for Edgemont Crossing at Flint Pond, 180 to 222 Hartford Turnpike, dated June 19, 2019, and revised on November 25th, 2019, and March 11, 2020. Prepared by R.J. O'Connell and Associates Incorporated, 80 Montville Avenue, Mass, 02180, stamped by John F. Stoy, John J. Stoy, P.E., and consisting of 24 sheets. The subject, the subject project is located on the south side of Hartford Turnpike and consists in whole or in part of Shrewsbury Assessor's Tax Plate 50, plots 126000 and 128000. And tax plate 53, plot 054000. A, a copy of the plans may be seen in the Office of the Planning and Economic Development Department at the Richard D. Carney Municipal Office Building, 100 Maple Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the applicant's present. I'm here for the applicant, uh, Mr. Chairman Mark Donahue, on behalf of the applicant. Do you have any other persons with you, or are you going to wing this on your own? Uh, no, Roy Smith of R.J. O'Connell will be par uh, participating in the presentation, and hopefully Mr. Cahill will be helping us with audio, with the visual uh, additions. I'm sure he will be a fine choice to choose for that. <laughs> so, all right. So if you would, please bring your, uh, bring your plan forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, Mark Donahue uh, from Fletcher Tilton on behalf of the applicant. The board will remember that we culminated the activity with regard to the approval of Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond uh, in January of this year um, and uh, immediately move forward in the design, in the next level of the planning, uh, particularly as it related to the buildings. Uh, part of that activity from the development team's viewpoint involved value engineering, taking a hard look now with actual contractors as to how costs might be able to be reduced in some fashion through the development. And what we have this evening is a, a presentation that relates only to the residential component of the development and presents in two different areas of the site. Uh, what we refer to as the easterly node, uh, and because this is a little bit hard without the plan itself, that is plan left as you look at it. The node of the residential there uh, has some changes and the southerly node, which is the, the part that is above, if you're looking at the plan, the market basket facility. The easterly node has the most material type of changes uh, that are involved. What it involves essentially, and I'm gonna have um, um, Mr. Smith review it in more detail with you, but by looking at the location of the buildings and ways to reconfigure the same buildings or substantially the same buildings on the site, we've been able to relocate the buildings to remove a, a significant retaining wall that was being used on the easterly side to retain the hill as one approaches the uh, Orchard Meadows condominium. Replace that with grading with a reconfiguration of the buildings and a relocation of the clubhouse slightly and the parking area that supports the clubhouse slightly. And I'm gonna have Mr. Smith review those in more detail with you. Those changes came about in part because we were able to take a harder look at the buildings themselves. The building footprints have actually shrunk in a very minor fashion and we've got a, uh, a display of that so you can see the, the material nature of it. Our covering uh, letter with regard to the application indicated that the total gross size of the buildings had re been reduced by about 2,000 square feet in total, so it's just a little bit change. That change also involved a reconfiguration uh, between the mix of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. When you approve this plan, there were 126 one-bedroom units and 124 two-bedroom units, for, or 50.4% of the site being one-bedroom units. With the reconfiguration of the building and making them more efficient, the total number of one bedroom units has dropped to 116 units or a reduction in 10 for 46.4% of the mix. And the balance is all in the two bedrooms. There are no units, as you know, exceeding the two bedrooms. That was achieved in, in part, uh, also allows some additional space to be created for common areas, uh, which has been built into the development uh, itself. Um, Moving to the southerly node, uh, the changes there are not as material um, as the easterly node or the, the plan left node, as I referred to it. They involve the removal 
of a couple of the garages that had been built uh, as or proposed as part of the original plan. Those have been substituted now for just surface parking. A reconfiguration of that area has also eliminated a retaining wall, which Mr. Smith will, will review with you. There are no changes to the total number of units. There is no change to the total number of parking spaces for the overall development. And as Mr. Smith will review, the easterly node, which has the parking that service, not just the units in that node, but also the clubhouse, um, it still meets substantially what we had before as far as that node's concern. Those are the nature of the changes um, um, that are involved. It ends up being from the residential component, we think a better plan uh, and a more suitable plan. And with your permission, I'll have uh, Mr. Smith with the assistance of Mr. Cahill walk you through the details of the plans. Yes, sir. Please, Mr. Please. Smith. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Uh, Bernie, if you could call up uh, slide two, which is the permitted East residential. Uh, yes, one second. Not a problem. Slide two, okay. Good evening, my name is uh, Roy Smith. I work for RJ O'Connell Associates. And what you're looking at here is the East Lee node site. Uh, so if, if you can uh, zoom in on that area, Bernie, a little bit. Yeah, is that zoomed in enough? Yeah, that's, that's zoomed in enough. Uh, you'll see that we have the same amount of buildings in this East Lee residential node and the reason why uh, the modification happens is if you look along the east side, we have a significant amount of plantings, but we also have two retaining walls, which I'll go into a little bit more detail with a different slide. But this is the permitted site plan. It has a six unit building and two 24 unit buildings in a clubhouse building and a pool. Uh, it also has three garages and the associated parking associated with that layout. If you could go to slide 3A, Bernie, now, which is the proposed versus the permitted. Uh, yes, one second. No problem. It should be sharing in one second. So this is the, the proposed modification. As you can see, we still have 136 unit building, 224 unit buildings, a clubhouse, which is slightly smaller than what was permitted in the pool uh, and the associated parking. What you see on the left side of the plan is a grayed out, out area, two red lines. That Those two red lines are were the previously permitted retaining walls that the current design design has eliminated. We've replaced those walls and moved that edge of pavement along the easterly edge of this easterly node further west by about 30 feet. Uh, and that allowed us to, <clears throat> excuse me, allowed us to eliminate that ret those retaining walls and it allowed us to modify the parking and the layout of the buildings in the clubhouse slash leasing amenity building. Uh, one of the other changes is the permitted plan had three garages. This easterly node is down to one garage. Uh, and then the associated parking associated with that. The parking loss in this easterly residential node is a total of 12 spaces. Uh, and the majority of those spaces are lost associated with the parking next door to the leasing amenities building. The permitted plan had a parking area on the upper side of the plan closest to uh, what is the leasing slash amenities building. So what we did in this modified site plan is move that leasing and amenities buildings parking right in front of the leasing and amenities building rather than behind it uh, or to the side of it like it was permitted. Uh, that leasing and amenities building and associated parking went from 14 spaces down to six spaces. Uh, so that was the majority of the loss of spaces. If you recall correctly, we also had some reserve spaces uh, associated with this Eastley residential node, uh, but that doesn't 
we didn't include those in the parking requirements because we met the parking requirements of the town, of, which is 1.5 ratio per unit. Uh, so uh, we didn't include those and we had a condition that we could go and build those in the future. This, this modified site plan does not have any reserved parking spaces. Uh, like I said, the, the basic premise of this is to do some value engineering as Mark Donahue alluded to, is uh, to eliminate those two large retaining walls and bring in that edge of parking and move it further west away from the Orchard Meadows property line uh, the clearing limit stayed the same along that that roadway uh, and so forth and so on. And now we have a graded slope uh, that replaces that reta those retaining walls. If you could go to now, I'm going to move to the southern residential node uh, and then I'm going to do that presentation and then just quickly review the units themselves, the building units footprint changes that themselves. Uh, so if you could go to slide four, Bernie, which is the permitted south residential. Uh, yes, one second, pulling it up now. Okay, it should be on in just a second. <laughs> Thank you. So what you're looking at here is what's already permitted. Uh, Mark Donahue was alluding to. Uh, we had three garages uh, in this southerly residential node. Uh, we also had a retaining wall along the left side of the plan, which is the east side of the plan. Uh, and we had some reserve parking. Uh, the modified plan, which is uh, Slide number five, if you could call that up, Bernie, I'd appreciate it. Yes, doing it now, one second. It should be on. It should be on and now. Excellent. As you you can see we've replaced and re eliminated the three garages and made the surf those surface level parking spaces which are much more efficient uh, we also were able to eliminate the retaining wall along the left side of the plan or the due east side of the plan uh, the clearing limit stayed the same uh, so but in the parking the parking we actually increased the parking in the southerly residential by nine spaces uh, so overall, from a parking perspective, uh, it essentially stayed the same. We lost 12 uh, in the easterly residential node. We gained nine in the southerly residential node. So we have a minus of three parking space. Uh, and the parking ratio stays about the same. Uh, the permitted parking ratio uh, per, per unit was a 1.56. And that has dropped by those three spaces down to a 1.55. The town's parking requirement for residential is 1.5 spaces per, per unit. So we still meet that. And as Mark was saying, the amount of units stayed the same. Uh, <clears throat> and that there was a slight change in print residential buildings as well. Uh, I'm going to move to that now, Bernie. If you could call up slide six, which is the building footprint. A 36 unit. Sure, one second. Okay, should be loading now. Can you see it? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so what you're looking at here is an overlay of the approved or the permitted building footprint for a 36 unit building versus the currently modified uh, building footprint. The currently modified building footprint is shown in red. The gray dashes are the permitted building units. As you can see, the foot jogs slightly more what was permitted, but it's a more efficient building. Uh, and uh, that changed for all the 36, all the building units, which there's nine residential buildings. Uh, it changed for the 
36 30. residential buildings, the 24 residential unit buildings, and the 30 building units. And those were incorporated into the modified site plan as well. Uh, with that said, that kind of does a general overview of both the easterly residential node modifications, the southerly residential node modifications, and then the residential building footprint modifications as well. So I'm going to turn it back to the board and would be happy to answer any questions or comments. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, if Mr. I might, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Mr. Just Donahue. to complete uh, our presentation, uh, these plans were submitted uh, when filed to Graves Engineering for review uh, as their peer review. As you'll recall, they did the review of the initial site plan. They have submitted to you a letter dated March 24th, 2020. Um, which I think speaks for itself that they find that they um, they have no issues with any of the proposed modifications. Their review included looking at some of the more detailed changes and some small changes to the the, uh, the drainage systems uh, and the like. Uh, the March 24th letter also indicates that the set of plans that you have now responded to what were some open comments that existed back in January from their letter. Um, that doesn't mean that this is the final set. We're still preparing a final, final set um, when after the board's action this evening. But it, it does appear that those plans and all those issues have now been resolved to um, uh, peer reviews, uh, uh, comments, and, and approval. Uh, we also have the benefit of the planner's letter uh, to you of March 26th uh, and have had a chance to review that um, and discuss that with Mr. Cahill. Be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you. We'll go around the board. Uh, Mr. Rodelay, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rodelay, this is recusing himself. Um, Mr. Thomas. The only question I had was that uh, the uh, the footprints of the building, the footprints are changing. What about the square footage? I, I may have missed that, I'm not sure. Yeah, the square footage changed slightly. I think Mark alluded to that in his opening comments. Uh, it, it They got slightly reduced. Okay, that's what I thought. Per, per building. Okay. That was my only question. Okay, Mr. Jerry. Um, along the same lines as Mr. Thomas, I was just wondering with the changes of the footprints of the buildings, are they still consistent architecturally with what was discussed before? Uh, they are. Uh, some of that has been advanced a little bit further uh, into uh, some of the designs. There were some, uh, if, if you were to look again at the uh, plans as far as the footprints, there were some uh, 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 areas that uh, uh, kind of abutted or, or uh, came out of the building in some fashion. Some of those have been uh, brought back into the structure. So some of the, the landscape or uh, strike that the architecture has changed, but it's, it's essentially consistent with what you've seen before. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to continue on that same line. So when I look at the architectural drawings near the back of the new plan set, it looks like these demonstrate the same kind of jogs that were in the original site plan. Can you uh, explain that a little bit to me, please? I'm looking at, um, for instance, just as an example, uh, sheet A20, A, I'm sorry, A200. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a full set of plans with me, Mr. Chairman, uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, what we're looking at. We'll see if Roy can find it as he leaves yeah, the kitchen. This, okay. Um, well, when I look at these particular, uh, this set, hopefully, I don't know, if Bernie, if you have, um, if you have the ability to get to the A200 sheet. I was just pulling up now, Mr. Chairman. If you wait one second while I control it. I will pull it up. Okay, it should be up in a second. Can you see it now? Yes, I can. So when you look at that, it looks like those jogs are coming out, whereas the um, one of the last slides that um, Mr. Smith put out there it looked like more, it was more straight in the front of the buildings. So I, when you look at, you know, the, the lower part of the drawing looks correct. It looks like um it doesn't have the chalk it's, it's very strange looking to me that's a, it, i just want to clarify to make sure that the architectural renderings that are in the plants that we currently have is a good representation of where we're going to end up 
I, I can speak to that maybe in a more general fashion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, part of the process of the value engineering uh, was a shift in the architects who had done the original plan to this set. Um, so I'm, I frankly don't know whether the plan you're looking at was a historical one that got carried over and is supposed to be reflected there. Uh, it's a fair question that we can certainly resolve and make sure that particularly as the architecture continues to evolve, we get a, a final set to Mr. Cahill and we can, um, if you wish, come back to another meeting of the board, uh, not in the form of a modification, we would ask um, and review with you with any specificity that might be required. Yeah, that, that would be fine. Um, also, I just got another question. So the two bedroom configuration changed. So the percentages flipped from majority and they're, they're very close. I get it uh, one way or the other, but the majority was single bedroom and now the majority is two bedroom where I believe it was increased by 10 units. Can you give an, uh, an idea as to what we think the impact would be to the school system based on that? I don't remember coming across any of the data on that. Um, I think when you go back and look at the fiscal analysis, um, it didn't distinguish uh, as far as uh, residents significantly uh, between the ones in two bedrooms. It talked more about the, the nature of the uh, mixed use development and the size of the units. Uh, it is, um, you know, uh, I think it, it may have some impact. The mix has gone by up by 10. Um, the common area, as I said before, I think was has actually been reduced um, that's available in each one of the buildings. Um, so there might be some modest change, but I would, but my recollection is that the overall impact for the 250 units was relatively minor. And so a change of the 10 units out of the 250 would be uh, fairly de minimis. Might be. Okay. Okay. Two. okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Does anyone, the, uh, anyone else on the board have any additional questions? You can speak freely. No, sir. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard? Um, we can try this first. I'm not expecting too much. So if we can try um, maybe chiming in, if there is someone from the, from the public, please unmute your device and say your name and address, please. I'm going to go with, we probably don't have anybody from the audience. So at this time, uh, Mr. Uh, Thomas, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing. I move to close the hearing uh, entitled Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond Site Plan Modification 20 Nominee Trust in the Mule Supermarket Incorporated, location 180 200 Pike. Do I have a second? Mr. Jerry. It's a second. Okay. I'm moving a second. All in favor, Mr. Jerry. In favor. Mr. Thomas. In favor. And I am in favor. So now we are at a point we can discuss. We uh, would like to uh, deliberate on this. Um, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Thomas. I move that we authorize the clerk to execute the decision entitled Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond, Site Flame Modification, Route 20 Nominee Trust in Demuo Supermarkets Incorporated, 180, 200, and 228 Hartford Turnpike. Do I have a second? I'll second that. And I'll go for roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Jerry. In favor. Mr. Thomas. In, in favor. And Mr. Boulay is in favor. So you're all set. Thank you. And Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very well. You guys. Stay safe. Thank you as well. Um, I did not mention this earlier, but for anyone that um, is com completed or concluded their uh, business with the uh, planning board, you're certainly welcome to stay on and, and watch. But if you could uh, ensure that you mute your device, um, that would be very, very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are now going to go backwards to uh, previous hearing. Is uh, Mr. Grenier in, in attendance? I'm here, thank you. Okay, so we will uh, go back to the next hearing, which is a continued public hearing for a common driveway and multifamily development site plan approval and special permit. Whitney Houston, I'm sorry, Whitney Street Home Builders LLC. 
257 Main Street. And if the proponents could please introduce themselves. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Grenier here uh, with J.M. Grenier Associates on behalf of Whitney Street Home Builders. Okay, do you have anyone else that will be presenting with you? Um, I believe Jim uh, Benincasa is, is here with me. Okay, very good. Um, if, uh, I don't know if you've been watching along, but if you um, are looking for any um, materials to be demonstrated on the screen, could you please work through Mr. Cahill and have him put the, um, the documents up for you? Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Bernie, if you could just put up the uh, the layout plan, which I believe is um, sheet three of, of the site plan set. Yes, one second while it loads, I will let you know. It should be up. Hold on. So I have this is the dated, uh, excuse me, dated March 17th as the most recent plan. I, I believe so, yes. Okay, so let me just scroll down to. Yes. There you go. So here we are. Yep, this is the site development plan. Go ahead, John. Sure. So um, these are the same plans that we have presented to the board at the last hearing. Um, if you recall, um, the board needed some time to be able to uh, review these plans because we had uh, just made some changes to them um, in response to both the board and uh, to the DPW. Uh, the changes to the DPW, they just wanted us to modify some of the service connection uh, hookups, which we met with the DPW about and um, made those changes accordingly. Um, really had no impact on the layout of the site, uh, so to speak. Um, the last change that we did make to the, make to the plan was um, we reduced the number of units for the, the rear, the most rear lot, the multifamily. Um, if you recall, our original submittal had a total of six units, um, and all of with six units, we still met all of our parking setback, open space, um, and lot coverage requirements. Um, the board did have some reservations about having a total of six units, so uh, in response to that, we have subsequently reduced the total number of units down to four. Um, you will also recall that we um, submitted materials. We had a full traffic study performed for this site, um, which was, uh, they did traffic counts um, for both uh, morning and peak um, driving conditions. And uh, the results of that were that we have plenty of site distance um, with the total number of increased numbers of, of cars um, I believe in the the morning or the evening peak, it's one additional car like every eight or nine minutes. And um, having the cycle of the lights over um, adjacent to the to the west, that um, there are breaks in the traffic, so there's no issues um, for vehicles coming in and out, especially during peak hours. So we had a full traffic report that we submitted for the board to review. Um, so again, this is the same plan that we submit, that we uh, reviewed at the last hearing um, and presented. And um, my understanding was the board just needed a little bit more time to review those documents that, that we submitted last month. Um, so this is really no, no different. The, only, the biggest change was that we reduced the total number of multifamily units to four. Uh, within the multifamily zoning district. Um, and I'd put it to, to Bernie if you have any other comments to make or, or the chair. Uh, Mr. Cahill, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think Mr. Grenier summarized his changes uh, well. Okay, thank you. I will go around the board for questions. Uh, Mr. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Boulay. I, I guess my main question, uh, is in regards to the traffic report that we received that was dated March 2nd that we got uh, just before the last meeting. And specifically, if you could address the capacity analysis that was conducted, um, it states in the report that that occurred on February 17th, uh, which by my uh, calendar here would be President's Day and also school vacation week. 
So I guess I would question whether or not this report is actually accurately uh, reflecting an average weekday at this site. Mr. Grenier. Uh, yes, I believe I can, if, I think I can hit present, um, Bernie. Can I, I have, um, I believe sections of the, uh, of the traffic report that I can, I can put up on the screen. Uh, yes, certainly one second. All right. So up now, this is page five, I believe. Uh, Mr. Jari is referring to this part right here that says uh, on February 17th, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure exactly what page that it is on in the report, but they do make modifications based on um, the, the season and the time. And so they do have an adjustment Oh, I believe it actually it's in that same paragraph, Bernie. It says, um, uh, according to Mass DOT adjustment factors, data collection in February need to be increased by multiplying by a factor of 1.01. .01. So it says the following diagram shows the adjusted turning movements counts for the intersection. So there are adjustments that they do make um, for when when the uh, when the traffic count is is made, so they do have adjustments made based on based on that. And as you can see, it's it's minimal. Well, I would imagine that that adjustment is based off of the average day in February. I'm not sure that specifically that day that would likely be the case. I would just question how accurate that those counts really are. I guess that that would be my one question, Mr. Boulay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jerry. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Um, Again, I have reservations about the density about of it, and you know, obviously, the traffic is an issue. And to Mr. Jerry's point, there was no school, nor most people had the day off of work that day, so that traffic study doesn't hold a lot of merit, in my opinion. And we've seen the same, you know, we've seen the plan multiple times, and. I still have reservations about the traffic and the density of it. Okay, is that all you have? That's it. Okay, um, I, I will echo your comments. I, I, I've been um, kind of harping on the density piece of this from the get-go. Um, certainly the um, internal circulation as well as the external circulation is quite a bit of a concern. And I know it's a, quite a bit of concern for the residents as well. Um, and I agree with Mr. Jerry's uh, opinion on the um, on the traffic study. I think a modification of 10% is not, I think, representative, but that's just me. Um, I forgot, Mr. Rolakis, you're back here. I, I, I skipped I'm right back. for you. <laughs> Would you do you have any questions or something of the applicant? I, I I'm not a traffic engineer or a statistician, but I don't see how. Uh, taking the traffic count for one day and then multiplying it by a factor of 1.01% uh, when that day is President's Day, uh, a holiday uh, during school vacation week is uh, going to give you an accurate reflection of what goes on there. I, I drive that road every day, um, or I was at the time when the, uh, my son was uh, going to school. Um, and I can tell you that uh, the traffic uh, uh, during school, uh, not in, uh, dur during a school day, is certainly uh, a lot uh, more significant than a, a vacation day or a, or a, a week when school is off. So I, I don't put much stock in this traffic study. Okay. Okay. With that, um, I. Believe I mentioned the things that I was uh, interested in speaking of. Um, this is a public hearing. Um, we're going to try this. I know there's probably a lot of people um, that have been present in prior meetings. And if you wish to ask a question uh, or get some clarification, I'm going to let's try it. Let's try it easy the first time. Let's first start with um, if you could, un if someone could start unmuting your phones. And then just please, as one person is speaking, if you hear someone speaking, please do not try to overspeak. And then we'll try, I'll try to get a list of names for those that are interested in ask, asking questions. 
and um, I will get back to each of you to ask your questions. So please, the audience, for the first person, could you please unmute your phone and give me your name and address? I heard something very faint in the background. Yes. Hi, oh, this is go. Lena Pasu. Lena Pasu. Yep. 24 Irita Road. Okay. Is there and another so, one? Um, yeah. well, for, hold on. I, I'm just looking for names at the moment. I will. I, I need to have an idea of how many people are willing to uh, ask questions, and I will get back to each one of you independently. Okay. So okay. if you could please yes, remute you. your phone and wait for me to call your name. Is there another one in the audience that wishes to be heard? There may be some slight technical difficulties. So while that, while people are trying to uh, figure out how they can go forward and unmute your phone and give me your name. We can go back to uh, Mrs. Pashu and you may ask your question. Sure. Um, and I think um, just to clarify for other people who may be on the phone, I think you have to press star six if you're on your phone to unmute it. You just don't press the unmute button. Um, but my 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 concerns or my my um, what I have to say is more of a comment, not a question um, in regards to um, the traffic study as well as um, the density of the property. Um, first and foremost, the property that's existing that's in the front, the new construction that is a blue um, house, um, we recently found out is a um, home for people with um, brain injuries and disabilities. Um, it's it made for five residents um, who will be living there. Um, and I had an opportunity to look up the company who um, is putting in this this property um, and through my research of it it requires a lot of in and out of traffic um, there will be food services laundry services um, uh, nurses coming in and out as well as other uh, people visiting those residents so that adds to the traffic that I believe is already uh, in existence there um, my second uh, comment would be towards my observations of the in and out of traffic there, um, even with, without the homes being uh, built. Um, I was on a walk a couple days ago and noticed a car exiting that 257 uh, property um, to take a right towards the lights in the intersection. Um, and obviously, during these times, during the pandemic, um, there is not a lot of traffic um, at all. And when that car did take a right out of that property, uh, the, the, the car coming down St. John's Hill had a slam on its brakes in order to avoid hitting that car. And that was just one vehicle. Um, so that's my concern. Um, I think with the property that's being built there right now, there's added traffic um, on top of what was already uh, concerning um, for both safety um, of the people living there and safety for the people driving up and down Main Street. Um, so those would be my comments, and I appreciate uh, the board taking uh, the time to hear my comments. You're welcome. Um, yeah, and thank you for your comments. Um, as far as um, I can comment a little bit about the traffic, the house that you described that's going to have the um, the brain injury uh, residence, that is part of an A and R lot that was not put in front of this board uh, at any time, um, uh, but it does ha have a factor certainly in the traffic. And um, I believe that that also plays into the traffic study because I don't believe that that is even operational yet. So I think it's going to have an impact as well. Um, is there someone else in the audience that wishes to be heard? I hear, I hear somebody maybe trying to hit buttons. <laughs> they may or may not be successful. Steve, could we ask Mrs. Pashu again what people press on their phone to unmute them? Yes, you have to press star six and then it'll unmute you. Okay, thank Any you. others in the audience can hear that and do the same? Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? I can. Can I have um, your name and address, please? Yes. 
Uh, this is Joy Wu. I live in 257 Main Street. So okay. everything you are talking about is just around my property. So I want to draw your attention, all the board members, about the lost ones. I am a medical professional in the pediatric department of UMass. I know exactly how much you need to take care of five brain injury patients in lot one. That will be 24-7 medical service with at least one nurse and two caretakers, three shifts per day. Plus, the lady already mentioned previously, you have to have medical services. You need to take those patients to MRI and to get a checkup from time to time. And these patients are wheelchair bound. If you look into that lot one, they have a blueprint hanging out there. Everything is designed for wheelchair bound patients. And they also need to have a home housekeeping service and three times a day meal delivery service. This lot one, which is in full service, will add a lot of traffic on that intersection. Not talking about the multiple families building behind our house, only the lot one. I wonder how much that small intersection is already very busy and problematic now can handle that huge demand only from lot one. And I also want to remind everybody, this is the uh, critical decision because it comes with a consequence that you cannot fix later on. So I appreciate every board member pointing out that the traffic study presented by the developer is meaningless because without the lot one in full service, we have no idea how bad the traffic would be. That's my point of view. I sincerely want everybody to take that into consideration. This is not about me or about our neighbors around this small area, but also about parents who have their kids in St. John's and Shrewsbury High School and everybody who commutes on Highway 290. That's my point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard? Could I speak? This is James, uh, James Van Casa with Whitney Street Home Builders. Yes, please. So this is one of the one of seven homes that we're working with CIL um, to build. They do not have a they don't have a, a service that comes in and, and brings the food in. Uh, not like anybody, you know, if you had delivery to your house, they would do the same thing. They have a kitchen in their home. They are, you know, they're training these people in order to live on their own. They have their own kitchens. Um, you know, this is no different than, you know, there is two people that do work that do care for the four occupants that will be in this house. This house in particular has four I think it's 70 to 80 year old women that do have brain injuries. Um, we work, I, I work a lot with these agencies. Um, and, you know, they're cooking inside the house. They're doing everything that everybody else is doing inside their house. This is a single family home and is in by, you know, mass general law, by a lot of things, this is considered a single family home. It's treated as though it is just a single family home. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard? I think someone's hitting buttons again. Bernie, can you tell if somebody's trying to uh, access? I cannot. Um, I can only hear the static that you're hearing. All right. Oh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Are you? Uh, can you please tell me your name and your address, please? Ma'am, I think we can hear you. Um, you are unmuted if you want to start talking. I think we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you identify yourself, please? Yeah, this is Joy Wu again. I oh. have an objection to what uh, the developer said, because uh, if he claims there will be only two patients living there, they are going to be uh, self-assistant. I want that in writing, presenting to the board. 
because from our own experience and also experience from our neighbors, they always tell you something that later that will be completely different. So this is a bitter experience. I want to share with the board members. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. We'll give it one more try. Is there anyone else that has any questions from the audience? Hello? Hello, please identify yourself. Lou LaRose, Dalton Drive. Okay. Please go forward. Yes, uh, with regards to the traffic, I'm glad that everybody's speaking up about it. Uh, the question I have is, uh, with the multiple units, how many uh, units are there, how many living quarters are there going to be in those? Okay, Mr. Grenier. Um, I believe there'll be two to three bedrooms. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lewis, do you have another follow-up question? Yes, w with regards to the traffic and the day it was done and the, uh, the time of the week, the fact the holiday and school vacation, uh, the amount of traffic that we all know St. John's brings in at the, the morning commute in the afternoon, uh, how is it going to be safe for the in and out of that tra of the uh, traffic that's going to come in and out? And what's the viewing space uh, distance when you're looking east coming out and you're going to take a right? Okay, Mr. Grenier. Well, based on the comments, obviously we're going to go back to the traffic engineer and get some um, updates to his study uh, to address any concerns about, about the timing of the study. Um, and in terms of site distances coming out and turning, to the, turning right to the west to go through the lights, is that the question? Uh, excuse me, I didn't. I didn't get your whole uh, question. Uh, are you concerned about uh, taking a right and going west through the lights and the site? No, I'm, uh, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm concerned about coming out and taking a left going east. Um, he did review that as well. That was part of his, his uh, review. And um, based on the, the speeds, there were adequate lines of sight and, and uh, stopping site distance based on his report. And uh, again, we're, we're going to go back to him and make sure he updates. In my opinion, um, what we'll find out, I don't think it's going to have any any bearing on um, on the total traffic and there's not going to be any improvements need to be made because there really is uh, limited numbers of cars coming in and out of this site during the peaks. But again, We'll go back to him and make sure he updates those numbers accordingly. Well, I think the study has to be done at the proper time when you're going to get the traffic flow. That's the only way you're going to get the proper traffic flow. You can't estimate it if you don't know the traffic flow to begin with. We're going to go back to him and make sure he updates his numbers accordingly, as I said. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard? Dean Tipple, 18 Irita Road. I'm sorry, you're a uh, Dean? Yes. Okay, uh, uh, 18 Irita Road? Yes. Okay, please uh, ask your question. Um, I noticed from the site plan that the, uh, the parking and the turn is going to be shining headlights directly into my backyard. What are you going to do to mitigate that? Mr. Grenier. Um, we are proposing a, a full line of uh, Arbor Vitae, or no, actually they're uh, evergreens, um, fast growing evergreens that will grow in thick so that it will provide year round screening for, for any vehicle, potential vehicle lights shining in. Okay, thank you. And any other questions, uh, Dean? Uh, there's that, and my biggest concern is density. Um, this is a residential community, and he's going to be putting in 
four multifamily. How many units per building are there? Two, three? Mr. Grenier. It's a total of a total of four. It's a fourplex building, so four units. Four units. In a space that's roughly equivalent to any lot on this road. That's kind of steep as far as population density. Uh, why do you want to encroach upon this residential community with such a high population density spot? Mr. Grenier? Um, I don't know that we're encroaching. Um, we meet all zoning setbacks. We are in a multifamily zone. We meet all of the, uh, actually we're less than what we could build um, with only four units. We reduced that. We could fit six units in there. We reduced it down to four. We meet all of the zoning requirements, setback requirements, parking requirements, uh, lot coverage requirements, et cetera. So, um, and we have, uh, we're supposed to have one and a half spaces, parking spaces per unit. So uh, with four units, that would be a total of six spaces. And I believe we have between garage parking, parking in front of the, uh, the garages. And uh, we have five overflow spaces. We have 21 spaces. So uh, we're three and a half times the uh, required parking. So we more than exceed any of the zoning requirements and we're just working within the regulation. Okay, thank you. I'm just concerned about the regulations. Um, when we bought this house and when all of our neighbors bought their houses, we were told that that was not a buildable piece of property. Yet right now we're being told that this is a buildable piece of property. My biggest concern is what else is going to be changed to impact us and reduce our property values. All right. um, I can I can answer that a little bit. The uh, first of all, zoning changes frequently. Um, one of the things that this board does not um, consider uh, ever is um, property values or building costs. To be honest with you, uh, the financial impacts are are not part of the purview. We are bound to. Um, hold developers accountable for meeting the rules and regulations and the bylaws of the town of Shrewsbury. And that's where we're, that's where we're at. So um, is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard? Hello, um, this is Joy Wu again. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, I want to add one request. Uh, there is, if you want a traffic study meaningful, the only traffic study will be conducted after the lot one in full service. Then there will be no ambiguity how bad the traffic would be after that one in service. That will be unbiased and comprehensive. Period. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to be heard? Yes. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Bala Belger, one I read up. Okay, please ask your question. Um, I, I and um, some of my other neighbors do have water problems in this area. Um, a lot of a high level of groundwater. How is this building um, going to impact the problems that we already have? Uh, Mr. Grenier. Uh, we did a full drainage design that was reviewed by the town's consultant engineer. We are capturing all of the paved runoff as well as the roof runoff. We are uh, recharging that into the ground, putting it into subsurface chambers so that we are reducing the amount of water that comes off the site after it is built compared to what it is right now. And again, we went out, uh, reviewed the soils. We did a full drainage analysis and a drainage design that was fully reviewed by the town's consultant engineer uh, who has given it his blessing. Hey, thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Okay, I think we may have gotten all the questions from the audience. Um, so let me um, go back to the board. Has the board heard all the information you need in order to close this hearing? Mr. Jerry. Yes, I'm all set, thank you. Mr. Thomas. Yes, sir, I'm all set, thank you. Mr. Rodelakis. I think I'm all set. And I am all set as well. I will entertain a motion. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, based on some of the comments from the abutters, we would like to go back to our traffic engineer and have him um, relook at the time of his study and, and make any modifications or, or adjustments that he needs to make on that. Um, so we would like to have the opportunity to, to go back to our, our traffic engineer and, and have him relook at, at some of his, uh, his traffic number. So the only, um, the only concern I have with that, Mr. Grenier, is uh, first of all, for this traffic study to have any credence whatsoever, I believe school would need to be in session and the construction of the um, a and R lot needs to be in operation as well. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with the state. I can tell you that it's not going to be open anytime before May. And that's probably going to be extended depending on what's happening here. I'm not sure what the time schedule is for the, um, the unit that's being constructed in front of the, um, of the property. Um, I'm not too certain that a, a traffic study is going to make that much of a difference in my view. As far as information, I think we have a lot of information that we can um, ascertain from all the hearings that we've had thus far. So I, I will defer to the board to see if they agree that we should uh, potentially continue this or if we have enough information. I believe the board said that we had enough information uh, to, to close the public hearing. So uh, will we, we poll the board? Um, Mr. Thomas, you're on my screen first, so I'll ask you. I have enough information, sir. Mr. Rodelakis. I think I have enough information. Mr. Jerry. Uh, I also feel as though we have enough information. And I, I believe I have enough information as well. So I'll now entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to uh, close the public hearing. You want to give the address, Steve? Oh, 257 Main Street. Uh, site plan, review, and special permit, common driveway. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I will poll the the members. Uh, Mr. Jerry. In favor. Mr. Rodelakis. In favor. Mr. Thomas. In favor. Mr. Boulay is in favor. Um, given the fact that we have quite a bit of information, um, plus all the public comments that have happened over these uh, several meetings. I would suggest that we take some time to review this information in greater detail as a board and be in a position to have a uh, deliberative answer at our next scheduled meeting, which I believe is uh, April, I'm sorry, May 7, if that's not correct, let me see. Does anybody know offhand if it's May that 7th? Is correct. May 7th is correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, does anyone have any um questions or comments to that suggestion no I, I, as the public hearing is closed I i'm guess. asking the board yeah oh i'm sorry no i'm asking the board if anybody has any if they if if they think that we should take some time to review all the information that we've received and be in a position to have a deliberative answer at our next meeting i agree with that i don't think we should i think we should deliberate and then decide at our next meeting. Mr. Jerry? I also agree with that. Okay. So what I uh, would suggest for the uh, members of the audience, um, there will be no more public comment, um, but uh, you're all welcome to join in our next uh, hearing, which is on uh, May 7, uh, likely to be broadcast uh, virtually again. Um, who knows, maybe, maybe things change quickly and we'll have an actual physical meeting. Uh, but there will be no public comment at that point, uh, but we will have an answer uh, relative to the site plan. Okay, thank you. Our next item of business is proposed zoning bylaw changes for the annual town meeting on May 18. This is a new public hearing. 
Uh, Mr. Thomas, do you have a public notice? I do. I'm going to pull it up. Sure. Thank you. Hold on one second, sir. Okay, I have it here. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> In accordance, uh, again, I'm going to read this off my phone. In accordance with the provisions of MGI Chapter 40A, Section 5, the Shoes Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. At 7 p.m., the Selectman's meeting room at the Richard D. County Municipal Office Building, 100 Maple Avenue, Shrewsbury, Mass., regarding proposed amendments to the Shrewsbury zoning bylaw as follows. Article, to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Shrewsbury, Section 2, definition, Section 3A, establishment of districts, Section 3B, district intent, Section 6, Table 1, Use regulation schedule by establishing the town center as a new district, inserting new definitions and new uses for the town center district and inserting the town center district info to the use regulation schedule or to take any action in relation thereto. Article, to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Shrewsbury relative to section uh, 18 area frontages, yard and lot coverages, Requirements section 16 off street parking and loading areas section 19 signs section 20 site plan by inserting the town center district into the procedures and standards of the zoning bylaw as it relates to parking signage and site plan review and approval or to take any other action in relation thereto. Article to see if there if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Shrewsbury relative to section seven development of sites and location of buildings and structures by inserting the new subsection 10 sounds to town or district or to take any other action in relation thereto. Article to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning map of the town of Shrewsbury by creating and establishing the boundaries for a new town center district or to take any other action in relation thereto article to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Shrewsbury section 6 table 1 use regulation schedule to allow for a marijuana cultivator and craft marijuana cultivator cooperative in the limited industrial zoning district or to take any action in relation thereto is that it okay, good sir okay thank you uh, mr cahill uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes, sir. Good. Okay. So um, we discussed last time at the meeting, or at our last meeting, we had a uh, workshop where we, or I went through the proposed zoning for the town center pretty much from beginning to end. So we've done that once. That's what it was for. We're not going to do that again tonight. Um, I will say before I start for anyone watching at home, or listening um, on their phones right now, that you can go to the proposed town uh, center rezoning webpage that we have up and all of the articles we are discussing this evening, you can find there, um, they're the most up-to-date articles um, for your review. So if you do have any comments and you didn't get to see this live tonight or you didn't call in, um, you can email myself or Emily Larson at the um, planning department and we will get back to you and share your comments with the planning board. So I just wanted to start off with that, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I thought the best way to do this tonight would be to go through um, section by section, um, obviously not word for word this time. Um, we're gonna try to keep it brief um, and to the point. So I'm gonna open up, I'm gonna give a brief overview of each section and each article that we're talking about. Keeping in mind article numbers have not been assigned yet by the, um, by the Board of Selectmen. So we're gonna just call them articles one, two, three, four, but there might be different article numbers in the end. So we are, I'm gonna start um, 
by going through them and then we can talk about um the if you guys have if you the planning board have questions or the members of the public um they can phone in now so um taking it from the top the first article we're calling it article one for now for our purposes um has to do with the new definitions that are being proposed and the changes to the use table so I wanted to open it up there. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the definitions. I was gonna see, do any of you have questions or comments or concerns about any of the changes in those two sections? That is table number one, the use table and the new definitions that are being proposed or any recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman, to go down the list. Okay, um, I only had one question and I believe after a small conversation with you, I, I think I, I got cleared up, but in case anybody else that may have been reading the definitions, I thought there might have been a conflict, uh, which it turns out there is not. On page seven, um, where there's a definition defining of, of other things, including veterinary hospitals, stables, kennels, and so forth, that would be allowed under the town center district with um, special permit by the planning board, and then later in the document on page 16 um, on the driving drive in establishment um, there was a reference to domestic animals and keeping other than customer uh, customary other than customary household pets that um, was not allowed and i wasn't sure if there was a conflict between the the vet hospital and domestic animals and on the scale find it a little better for me so if you want to just please tell the audience what you told me and no absolutely and i looked at it again um this morning um before our meeting tonight the difference is that you're looking at is the first one is for something more like an animal hospital a veterinary clinic um that we're all familiar with taking our pets there dogs or cats for appointments um the keeping of domestic animals is um i think the key word there is domestic so it's not a business it's your personal possession of an animal that's not a traditional dog or cat. Um, so these, I think, and I think where there is, this goes back to is, um, and there's a few different versions as I was looking again today of different things regarding farms and uh, farm animals and the like. And I think the thing is, is that we have to keep in mind zoning in Shrewsbury was created in 1967, which is now 53 years ago. And Shrewsbury was a very different town than it is today. Um, it was a lot more of a farming community than even a veteran community in some ways. Um, so I think a lot of that has to do with that, the keeping of domestic animals. We're talking things like chickens and geese and so on and so forth um, versus uh, the other thing, which is more of a commercial purpose, which is your veterinary clinic, your kennels. Um, I think one of them is stables. Um, I don't think we have too many stables left in town. Um, so it is, it was, it is a good point. It was a good question. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else on the board have a question? I will poll the board. Uh, Mr. Jerry. Um, I did actually have one question uh, just regarding the definition that you have there, Bernie, for accessory dwelling unit. And then uh, that versus if you go forward to page uh, I think it was also on page 16, um, where it says that the dwelling unit for a watchman or caretaker when contained in the same structure as permitted use is not allowed. How would you differentiate that from an accessory dwelling unit? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, so hold on a second. Let me pull those up for, um, do you want me to actually pull them up or do you want me to just speak to them, Mr. Chairman? Uh, if you feel that it would be better to bring it up, you're, you're welcome to. Um, it, better for the audience, I believe, because we have it. We're actually able to read it ourselves. Right, certainly. So um, one second, let me pull it up. Okay, so accessory dwelling unit was... H16. Right, so right there, you can see it. Can everyone see that on their screens? Yeah. Yes, sir. So accessory dwelling unit. So right, so that is essentially what an in-law... Uh, apartment is, except for there is no requirement to be a blood relative, um, something which, in my professional opinion, is, is getting a little outdated, um, the whole blood relative thing. Um, we define families uh, quite differently these days and more flexible. So accessory dwelling unit, that is where you have essentially a small apartment on your property. 
Um, and again, if you go down to, you said it was page 16. I always forget. Yes, so, yeah, it is 16. Page 16. Go down to overnight. Okay, it's somewhere here. It's the second. It's the second use down on page sixteen. Oh, dwelling unit for a caretaker. So, as it happens, um, for the first time in anyone's memory here, about a month or two ago, someone approached us for a uh, caretaker. So, no one in living memory could remember someone actually using this use. Um, but I think the difference is again is um, one of them is for a more commercial purpose. So when you have a watchman or a caretaker, um, I think these days of places like extra space storage, where they have a on-site residential person, um, and I know this from speaking to the person I um, <laughs> who, who I used to store stuff in, um, how he moved around the country um, with his, his wife, and they would give him a residential establishment on-site, and his job was to take care of all of the um, storage units on site, you know, he was the day and uh, night watchman, if you will. Um, so he had 24 hour kind of access to the site and he was meant to take care of it in a security fashion. Um, and I think this goes back again to a time when we didn't have so many um, uh, CCTV cameras and so on. Whereas the accessory dwelling unit is more of, again, it's like an in-law apartment, except for it doesn't have to be your in-law. Um, and there, there's not necessarily, there's not a business relationship there, right? Someone is, is just, they're living there for the sake of needing a place to live. So does that make sense, Tim? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I just wonder if there's some ambiguity there, because if I wanted to rent a unit to someone, uh, you know, under your definition of accessory dwelling unit, and then I decided later to employ that person as a gardener or say they're a nurse and they're taking care of one of my relatives who lives in the home. I, I don't know, it just struck me that there could be, um, there's a lot of gray area between those two that could prove to be problematic since they, one is allowed and one is not. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy. Uh, what would you suggest? I'm happy to take a suggestion. Were you thinking uh, by right or special permit perhaps as the same I, thing? I guess I just felt like the dwelling unit for a watchman or caretaker would be allowed based on just putting in the accessory dwelling unit. I, Right. So I, I'm not sure that, I guess I see much of a difference there. I understand what you're saying, I guess, in the more traditional case, but I just wonder how you define caretaker could really change, I guess, how this is interpreted. That's a, you make a really good point. Individual or taking care of property or what are you taking care of, I, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, well, I don't even believe we have a definition for watchman or caretaker. So. I'm happy to entertain that, and I will make a note to make a change for um, to changing it from no to a yes. So be consistent with accessory dwelling. Now. I think it's a really good catch. Okay. That's all I had, though. Everything else I was very comfortable with. Great job. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rodelakis. I'm all set. You know, I think that uh, Bernie's done a good job, and again, uh, I, I think that. Uh, We'll wait for a user and invariably we'll end up having to tweak the bylaw just like we did the Lakeway bylaw. So I think this is a good uh, first uh, go of it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thomas? I addressed my concerns with Bernie the other day about the parking issue. Uh, so that's good. To Tim's point, though, I never, I didn't really catch that. Yeah, that's a very broad definition of what a caretaker could be or is or you know i guess you could say that it, anybody could be taking care of anything so good catch tim i didn't see that but uh, other than that i'm satisfied that's why we have such a good board <laughs> <laughs> you care, well thank you all um i'd like to still continue on and go to the yes, next please. article so that was the use table and definitions mm -hmm. um i'd like to move on to the next section which is um the Oops, hold on. Which is, I call article two, but really this is the, um, this article is to create the new subsection of the bylaw to establish the town center district. Um, and I'm just gonna go through it real fast, section by section. Well, not so fast, but um, so at the top of this is um, the first section. Hold on, why don't I just share it? I'm gonna share it, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, something to go with here. 
Uh, can everyone see it now at the top? Yes. yes. Building. So I'll zoom in if we need to. So the first section here is this is going to be the so this is what it would look like starting at section U here at the top where you can see the hand. Um, this is the purpose of the town center district. So this is just explaining to applicants, to town residents, to future planning boards and current planning board members um, what it is that we're trying to achieve with the district. Um, the second section here is criteria for special permits in the town center district. These are going to be the criteria that the planning board uses when evaluating a new development in the town center. So I'm going to stop there and see, does anyone have any questions, concerns, or comments for these two sections? No, sir. No, sir. No. 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 All right. Um, moving right along, um, the next section speaks to the dimensions and intensity regulations of what would be allowed in the center. So in terms of minimum lot size areas, minimum frontages and setbacks. Um, I did want to note that through a special permit um, at the moment, what's being proposed is that someone could have a larger setback um, for the uh, rear yard setback. Oh, no, sorry, not the rear yard setback. The, front yard setback and the side yard setbacks um, were um, that to come up. Um, this was especially brought up around the reuse of the existing Beale site, um, were someone to come forward with a proposal that does not include um, retaining the existing school building, um, or does, excuse me, does include existing, keeping the existing school building, of course, you're going to have quite a big setback from the front yard. So we don't want to exclude that. But then we thought, well, there could be other instances where this might be a possibility. So we wanted to keep it in there so the board has some wiggle room or a um, very unique or special uh, proposal to come forward and the board um, needed to adjust that setback. So that was kind of the biggest thing I drew out of that. Um, we are talking about two and a half stories um, by right um, and then by special permit, any uh, 40 feet and three stories. So again, we're adding a layer of scrutiny and um, discretion to the planning board for anything bigger than two and a half stories. So any questions about dimensions before I move on? Oh, nope, I'm all set. I'm all set. Okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. Good. All right. So moving right along, um, the next section is design standards and guidelines. Um, and this starts to get into the built environment, as we call it, uh, in the planning world. Um, so what you're actually witnessing, experiencing. Uh, the first section is um, site circulation which is mostly around uh, emphasizing differentiating. The emphasis here is on differentiating spaces between cars and pedestrians, making sure that there is a, a significant um, difference in what you're seeing and viewing and experiencing. So are there any questions regarding that section? No, I'm all set. No, I'm fine. Okay, so hearing none. <laughs> Moving right along, the next section is property frontage. So this focuses on what is happening between the front of buildings and the edge of pavement. So things like enhancing the pedestrian experience and creating a real sense of place. It talks to things like wider sidewalks, street furniture, and the like. Um, any questions on that? Quite a big section. No, I this one I I think I like this section one of the one of the most because it does start giving some guidelines for uh, for design standards. Um, and, and they are not set in stone, they are guidelines. And some of them we can really utilize pretty well. Right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, we also, this is where we have our first really big graphic demonstrating um, essentially what the words say above, which is why I really like having these uh, schematics and images in the, in the zoning because sometimes they speak a thousand words, right? And in this case, all those words above it, points one through nine, pretty much you look at this picture and that's that's all we're saying is that what you see in this picture is, is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of summarizes it well. So without any other comments, um, the next section flows right into uh, landscaping, of course. Um, so when we're talking about frontages, this is the part that talks about types of landscaping, um, recommendations for types of planting, and also ultimately who's responsible for upkeep. Um, in this case, it would be the um, 
owner of the site that controls the site plan. So the most recent site plan controls and whoever the owner is of the property and owns that site plan has ultimate responsibility for upkeep. So I think that's the most important point in that. Any questions about landscaping? I'm all set. Fine. I agree that it should be the property owner's job to maintain the landscaping and not any business. I'm all set. All right. Um, so the next section is screening. Um, the screening, this is really short. This is just, um, this was actually brought up at one of our meetings. People were concerned about screening things like HVAC units and the like. So I don't think there's too much to say about that. Simply that when they do have um, rooftop or side of roof or anything else kind of um, utilities that these are fenced off and landscaped um, so that people don't walk by looking at them and seeing them. Uh, the next section is um, the next few sections then we really start to get into, uh, this is called building form. So building form talks about like the mass of buildings um, and uh, it brings, so it talks about massive buildings, how to break up those masses. So we're not getting just large square blocks. Um, it starts to touch on the architecture a little bit, but really it's speaking more to volume and massing than anything else. And we've managed to put in, we found two pictures for this. Um, the one on the right is about breaking up uh, the massive building. You can do smaller buildings. And then the example below is when you do have a large building with a blank wall, you could put smaller shops in front to again, break up the facade and that type of thing. Um, so any questions about building form? No, I'm all set. Fine. All set. All set. Okay. So next we really get into the architecture of it, um, building entranceways and orientations. Uh, we talk about roof lines, dormers, right, and fenestration, which is just a fancy way of saying windows, um, and building materials. So this is really the nitty gritty of the architectural best practices for creating buildings that are going to be interesting and have attractive features. So we're trying to get away from um, blank walls, single colors, single materials, and the like, um, and create interesting nooks and crannies, if you will, um, that aren't just blank facades, right? That have some sort of different depths to them that have um, different design materials and the like. So that's kind of the purpose of these next three or so um, sections regarding design. Does anyone have anything about that to say? No, oh, I'm all set. I'm fine. All set. All set. All right, so our last three sections, this is the first of our last, is um, we move in to talk about lighting um, and signage. So specifically the types of lights and signage that are either required and encouraged um, or are prohibited. And the ones that are encouraged, kind of the, if you will, the parameters for their designs. So without getting too deep into the um, details, we give a wide latitude for what can be included. Um, and then kind of are pretty strict about what cannot be included. Uh, things like open neon signs, um, big plastic can signs and the like. Um, and then also, as I'd mentioned at the previous meeting, we had a, a very loud positive response toward um, what, what's called dark skylighting. So we decided to actually put in a, um, a schematic for that as well, as you can see on the right, uh, which was not included last time. I don't know if we'll stick with this exact schematic, but. I think that's the idea to show um, the dark sky compliant lighting. And then of course, uh, signage, exterior lighting and, and the like, mm -hmm. and then prohibited signage. So anything about lighting or signage that anyone has any questions, comments, amendments? I think it looks good. No, oh, I'm fine with it. Yeah, it's looks good. Fine with me. Good, so this is the one, the section Jay brought up earlier. Um, and again, I think this is kind of maybe the um, one of the larger changes to how we typically do business in town. Um, but this really is kind of becoming the standard practice for planning and probably best practice for parking, um, which is rather than us set the parameters right for different developments, the developments themselves have to propose and be approved a parking report by the planning board. 
um, for their clay plan or a special permit. So this happens during the review process and the board's gonna sign off on it, whether they think it works or not. It's not without any standards at all. Their baseline would be the Institute of Transportation Engineers, um, which is a, a nationwide um, engineering um, association, if you will, that sets standard for parking. Um, but typically, and I think to Jay's concern is this is where we really find that the market drives the parking amount. Because if you're a developer and you have a mix, let's say you have a vertical mixed use um, on your site, you want to make sure that for it to be a successful long-term investment, you want to make sure that that parking works out, right? That you're going to have either on-site parking, um, shared parking, or some other kind of arrangement. Um, and we provide for those in this site. So they kind of blend together. So you can see below as I scroll down, we, um, we say if there is off-street parking, we really prefer it behind in the rear. Um, if not, if it's on the side under a special permit, you can do it, but we want some sort of barrier um, to be in between it and the uh, pedestrian thoroughfare. We're allowing for remote offsite parking. And we put a schematic in for shared driveways and combined parking lots. So it's all kind of, of one piece, the parking. Um, so I'll pause there and see if anyone has any comments. I I understand Jay's concern about the shared parking um, potential issue, but I think you're 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 right, Bernie. I mean, this is this is the whole kind of nuts and bolts of what we want to have happen down in this particular area. So I think the um, the market will dictate a lot of the parking um, issues that I think Jay may be um, concerned about. But I, I I'm all set. Other than that, okay. Anyone else? I'm fine with it. Also fine. I'm okay. fine with it. All right. <laughs> Thanks. And I think to um, Steve Rodelakis' earlier point is that all zoning gets revised over time. Um, you know, it, it happens literally every year in our town. We're always looking to update or improve or revise some kind of zoning that's been around maybe for decades. So. It's, you know, this is our start. And if in the years ahead, we find something's not working, well, the town has the power to go in and change it and make it work. So um, I think that's a really a good point to emphasize. Uh, and then finally, the last section is just to go back to Tim Jari's point is um, this just buffs out kind of what can, what kind of accessory dwelling units can be allowed in the town center and sets the parameters and um, requirements for that in that section. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if at this point you want to go and see if there's anyone in the audience who wants to weigh in, who's called in, if we want to take I a pause. Will, I will certainly entertain that. If there is anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard, could you please identify yourself? What's the trick? Star six? We yeah. have to share that with the other boards. <laughs> yeah. I know on mine, all I had to do is hit the, the mute button. It worked fine for me, but all phones are different, I guess. Yeah, I think if you're trying to call in, it is star six to unmute. I think we don't hear it from our end, but they might from theirs. Okay. I'm okay. Uh, I, Go oh, ahead. I hear somebody. Does somebody wish to speak? I don't see anyone on the line other than us at the moment. Okay, very good. Well, I do I do want to note one thing. I, I believe um, Ms. Larson sent along an email to uh, the planning board um, yes. with a very detailed um, accounting from uh, Mr. Sigilnik. Excuse me, I pronounced his wrong name wrong. Mr. Sigilnik um, that I, I haven't had a lot of time to read because it only arrived this morning to me, um, but I I looked at it quickly. I think he's got some pretty good points in here and um, I think it'd be a good opportunity for us to review it. And then if we have any questions or want to challenge it against what the, sound, the this, this particular article, these particular articles are trying to drive towards just to make sure they're aligned. Um, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's, it's not bad. So um, hopefully Ms., Mr. Sigilnik can show up for the meeting if we have one in person next week or I mean next month or has the opportunity to call in, um, be certain to let him speak on the, that behalf. Other than that, I didn't receive any other uh, comments from the public. I don't know, if Bernie, if you have. Um, he's really the first. I've received a couple 
kind of general positive comments, but not as detailed as Mr. Sigilnik's uh, comments. That is, I did upload his comments to the Google Drive for the board to read. Um, and as they come in, Emily, Emily and I will share them with the board as we get more of them. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, there's just two more quick articles to go through and um, then we'll be done. So let me just open up again the next one. This is the one of, oh, of course, it shut off my folder sharing ability. But the next one is, so of course, as we go um, through all this, we need to make changes throughout the zoning bylaw, um, the zoning bylaw parts that already exist to make it fit, um, of course, to make it fit in, right? So mm -hmm. hold on. Technical difficulty, it decided I, I didn't want to be there. Okay, it's back. Can everyone see the article? Yep. It's loading. Mm -hmm. Loading. Yes, sir, we can see it now. I can see it now. Okay, so the purpose of this article, what I refer to as Article 3 at the moment, it's our third article that we're um, discussing tonight at this public hearing, um, is again, it's to make the changes throughout the bylaw that um, are gonna have to incorporate the town center into them. So and in this one, we talk about, um, this is to allow for uh, buildings with zero setbacks. Um, so you can have adjacent buildings sharing a party wall. Um, the second section is related to parking and pretty much that long paragraph, All it, it's a very long way of saying, please refer to the town center district section U um, to see what you need to do um, for your parking. Uh, it's just a long way of saying that. Uh, it looks it looks intimidating, but really we could, we could even maybe tighten it up a bit more. Um, then moving right along, um, this next one is a change to um, the parking requirements that require landscape strips um, to be between um, different, let me see, between property lines, right? So when we talked about the whole um, combined parking lots, obviously this would be a problem if you have to put a five foot strip between your combined parking lots that wouldn't be combined anymore. So we put this, um, we proposed this little um, touch up here at the end um, that basically large lots, including the market block when we spoke about tonight, don't have to do this when they're crossing um, borders or, or town, uh, excuse me, lot lines. I'm losing the plot. Um, the lot lines, um, you don't have to put that border if it's a large site plan, basically. Um, and then finally, um, again, under the signage section, it says refer to section U for your all your signage needs for the town center, for your um, how that's going to work. Um, and then we've done a few tidied up items here. Um, and then this section here probably is the most important. This is section seven. These are the, um, the triggers that trigger site plan approval by the planning board. So for Steve Rodelakis' sake, I actually put in all of the language that it exists today, plus the ones we're proposing. So number five and six are brand new and then seven, eight, and nine continue as they are today. Um, so any vertical or horizontal mixed use would trigger a site plan approval. And this was the part that hung up Steve last time was um, any proposed development that contains or that contains buildings or structures with combined gross floor area, old and new, exceeding 7,500 square feet in the town center district. And the reason I wanted to put number seven there is so um, not just Steve, but everyone can see that this is actually just a reflection of what exists already today. Um, under number seven and almost word for word, uh, any new development. Um, and I spoke with the um, building inspector, Patty Sheehan about this. And we had a, a long conversation about the language um, because Steve brought it up and I wanted to make sure I followed up on it. Um, and she and I kind of, by the end, we agreed that the language that is being proposed in section six or number six is already what we have and what we've been using successfully for years. Um, for regular site plan approvals. And what it does is it allows us, myself and, and um, the building and planning departments to have some leeway and discretion about when this is triggered. But for the most part, it hasn't been an issue um, whatsoever. It's pretty obvious when somebody's adding uh, an amount of parking or in this case, building space that exceeds the existing 10,000 square feet. Um, so, we didn't really have an issue with it. Um, Patty didn't have an issue with it interpreting it. Um, so I would leave it at that. Um, 
I think, Steve, if you can come up with different language or if you can find it in a different town, I mean, I can keep looking myself, but um, our bottom line was that we have this language already and we're pretty much just duplicating it, but just making the threshold a little lower for the town center. Okay. So any, any questions about this one? No, I appreciate your efforts, though, Bernie, to look into it with uh, Ms. Sheehan. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't going to let it go, so. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm also no, it looks good. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I um, want to take a look at Article 4. Can, did the uh, map pop up for everyone? Yep. Okay. Yes. So this is simply the proposed zoning district as it stands today. So this is proposed open for discussion. Um, I don't know. There's not too much else to say about it. Uh, you can see the existing limited business and you can see the other existing zones. So um, if you have a concern or comment about it, um, if you don't have one tonight, just let me know later. So any questions about this? Nope, I'm all set. Nope. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't see anyone from the public online. <laughs> okay. So we'll take I, that as it. They've lost interest in us. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> I find this the most interesting part. So, um, but that's okay. I'll take it. I'll take it as uh, everyone's really happy. So, um, so the next one is actually okay. So we're going to jump ahead. This is another article that has nothing to do with the town center um, that's been come up, um, and this is to change the um, marijuana cultivators and craft marijuana marijuana cultivator cooperatives to include um, the limited industrial um, zone to allow them to take place in the, uh, or I should say set up shop in the limited industrial zone. If you look at this map, that is the uh, darker blue area along Route 20 for the most part. Um, I guess from what I understand, the phone calls have not been coming to my office, but I guess they've been going to selectmen and town manager saying that what was approved two years ago was um, it's too limiting. So this one actually um, will now mimic exactly what's happening for the testing laboratories. Um, these are not retail sales. This is all just um, cultivation. So and all cultivation has to be inside. So there's no exterior cultivation. So the board has been asked to consider this. So are there any questions about this one? No, I'm also. It's fine. No questions. No questions. Hi, no Bernie. Questions. This is Purna. Um, Hi, Purna. Bernie, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you yeah. hear me? You, you you said all cultivation has to be inside. I, I wasn't sure quite uh, uh, sure what inside meant. Uh, so it has to be, it can't be out in a field somewhere. It has to be four walls and a roof, basically. Um, that is written into our bylaws already. Um, so all growing has to be in, uh, interior growing. So inside a building. We're not going to have farm fields of um, marijuana plants everywhere. So, Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing this now. Um, so that leads us to our final business of the night, Mr. Chairman, which is new business. Mm -hmm. um, we have been, the planning board has been asked to um, make a recommendation. Let me pull it up here for the, for the town to proceed with um, the layout for Point Road and Nelson Point Road. So this is just to uh, allow the board of selectmen on the 14th of April to move forward with um, laying out the roads for Point Road and a portion of Nelson Point Road. So uh, there was a letter that was in your Google Drive that uh, is from Andy Truman, town engineer, stating that the engineering department, that they are satisfied with what's been done on the road um, to date, that there is still a small punch list that they're going to come up with um, for the applicant to do, but that for the most part, all major issues have been taken care of. So. What I need you to do is simply to vote um, to recommend that the town proceed with the layout for Point Road and a portion of Nelson Point Road. Okay, seems easy enough. Steve, would you like to make a motion? I just have a question. Um, sure. 
I was on the board. I think uh, Mr. Gordon and myself may have been the only two members that were on the board. Now, usually the, and I know it was an existing uh, public way that the applicant had to kind of realign, but isn't it usually the applicant's responsibility to do the road layout plan? Um, that's, so they have, they submitted the road layout plan to engineering. So engineering, has, sorry, I should have been clear. So the applicant did submit the as built and to engineering, engineering reviewed it um, and they're still reviewing it. And I've been working with them to finalize the last couple of um, things that they need to do. It's some of it's engineering speak to me, but most of it, um, from my understanding is all the major engineering aspects have been taken care of. Um, and there are some minor issues that they believe are not an issue to sort out in the coming weeks. So, so but the applicant that's on the applicant's nickel, correct? Correct. That is correct. Okay. That's what I wanted yep. to make. So I think that was part of the bond. Yes. Yeah. We're still holding a pretty substantial bond for that project. Okay. All right. Then I guess what we're looking so you, for, for a motion for a motion is. I'm so at this time, you're going to make a motion for the town to proceed with laying out the road. You're actually going to get another bite at the apple next month um, where your actually recommendation to accept the road will be taken. So you will get the layout plan between now and then. This is just for them to proceed with laying out the road, the, the selection. I move that we, uh, again, I move that we authorize. Recommend. We, we, I move that we recommend that the town uh, proceed with the layout plan uh, for the Nelson Place uh, Road uh, realignment and subdivision. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, I will poll the audience, uh, well, the members, I should say. Uh, Mr. Jerry? In favor. Mr. Rodalakis? In favor. Mr. Thomas? In favor. And I am in favor. So we say four in favor. So you are good to go, Mr. Cahill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. Um, before you sign off, I just wanted to say thank you to all the board members, um, all the applicants and the um, members of the public who tuned in tonight and participated. I know these are challenging times and we really appreciate um, all of you putting in the effort and all of your patience with this. Um, we're getting it down and um, I think it went pretty smoothly. So congrats to all of you for your first meeting online and um, Here's to not many more. I hope it wraps up soon. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would echo, echo your comments only to, to say that um, if there are um, comments um, relative to um, public hearings such as these, uh, please direct them to the town manager's office and he'll certainly uh, convey them because it's not just our board. There's many boards that will be going through this, at least for the small foreseeable future. And anything that we can do to improve, I think would be a benefit for everyone. So at this time, I'll entertain say, a motion for before adjournment. We, oh, before, we, before we concur, I'd like to adjourn. I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Boulay and Mr. Cahill for doing a wonderful job and keep letting it go smoothly. And I think everything went well. So thank you guys very much. Well, thank you. Do I have I, a motion to adjourn? I move that we conclude this evening's public hearings. I will poll the board. Mr. Jerry. In favor. Mr. Thomas. In favor. Mr. Rodalakis. In favor. And I am in favor. So this, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all and have a Thank wonderful and safe night. Thank you very much. Good night.